refer to the Dung Gate or the Moroccan Gate leading to the Jewish Quarter. At your left hand side, this is the modern buildings built starting from 1967, where we have a religious school with donations from different countries. You will see soon the name Dan from Canada, one of the donors for building uh, many religious schools in Jerusalem. But if you look at your right hand side, facing the temple, this is the southern western corner, southwest. Uh, take the western side and you can see that there is a remain of a bridge that used to exist in the past. That bridge used to connect the upper building of Jerusalem, the upper hill of Jerusalem where the priestly family used to live. The bridge used to be used only by the priestly family by the high priest, by the priest, who used to come from the rich side of Jerusalem directly to the temple. They had a special entrance, not like everybody. So this is, uh, uh, those remains are part of the original bridge that used to exist before the destruction of the temple in the event. Beneath it, you will see it soon, we have the original Herodian street. For sure, Jesus, must have walked along this street when coming from the Ophel, I mean the, from the city of David, to the Pool of Bethesda. They must have continued straight. Today they could not continue straight because we have houses built in the old city. But there is a tunnel that is visited by people where you can walk along the foundation of the temple itself. I, with my, I, with my hands, I have touched the foundation of the temple that has 13 meters length, one block of stone that weighs the volume of two Boeing airplanes, making 13 meters of length, so 39 feet of length, one block of stone, 630 tons. Uh, one wonder how could they possibly have brought it to this place in that time. So this was Herod's, and Herod's uh, works thanks to the slaves that he is. So the southern western side, this is the western wall. So what you're going to see soon the, is the section of the western wall that makes about 150 feet out of the, uh, out of the 1,200 feet of length that represent the length of the Temple Mount area. What you see to the southern section is the original entrance of the temple, but you see buildings that were built by the Muslims, by the Umayyad, at the places where, have, where we have cypress trees, there has been palaces built by the Muslims at that time. And to the other side, we have crusader buildings, and then the entrance itself to the temple from the time of Jesus. All right? So we're going, following all those people who are giving us.
No need to come to this place. You agree? Yeah. Up to the year 70, this place was nothing. It was part of the outside world. It was not holy. Why it's holy today? Because Jews cannot get to the, to the place where the holy of holiness used to exist. Because in the Jewish law, it is written. It's not because there is a Muslim shrine. In the Jewish law, it is clearly written that a Jew must not walk close to the place where the Holy of Holiness used to exist in order not to profane the holiness of the place. So, today we have this section of the outside walls where Jews can get the closest possible to the Holy of Holiness. So this is the reason why it is a holy, if not the holiest place for the Jews in the world. Because it is the closest to the place where the Holy of Holiness used to exist. So the temple was the house of God for the Jews. During the first temple period, the Holy of Holiness used to host the Ark of the Covenant, the Ten Commandments, plus the manna, and the Divine Presence of God. When the Ark of the Covenant disappeared with the destruction of the first temple, when the second temple was built, inside the Holy of Holiness we have the menorah that used to represent the Divine Presence. So in the incident, because of the first revolt between Jews and Romans that started in Caesarea Maritima in the year 66 and passed by Jerusalem in the year 70 and ended in the year 73 with the fall of Masada. The temple was destroyed. It was the most catastrophic moment for the Jews in the world because uh, the temple was the focus point for the Jewish faith. They used to come three times a year as a must to Jerusalem to offer sacrifices. <coughs> so after the, after the destruction of the temple, uh, Jews were able to come to this area to pray and to cry the destruction of the temple. But they will not be able to come close to this area since the second century because of the second revolt that has a catastrophic results because Hadrian prevented Jews and Judeo-Christians from venerating their own shrines in Jerusalem. He built pagan temples wherever there is a Judean or Judeo-Christian shrine. And he ba banned the Jews from staying in Jerusalem. And he would impose a tax on every Jew to be paid because of the revolt. Jerusalem would be called Elia Capitolina. The, the design of the city will change. So, when uh, Islam arrived, they managed to build the Dome of the Rock at the place where the temple used to exist. Because the consultant of the Imam at that time was a Jew, Ka'b al Akbar. And he told him that at this place there's been a holy place for the Jews. Where, where, where. So, at, the, at that time, the, is, the Islamic idea was close. Until today, it's close to the Jewish idea of the, the philosophy, the Quran. Very close to the Torah and to the Bible. So, well, maybe for this specific reason, the mosque would be built exactly at the place where the temple is. 
maybe to attract new believers to the Muslim faith from the Jews and from the Christians. It was later on in the 691 when they will build this huge site, the Dome of the Rock, to attract other Christians to this new faith. So, all over the history of the, of the country, we have seen Jews coming from time to time to this place to pray and to cry for the destruction of the temple. It was the most tragic points, events in the life of the Jews. So this is the original 70 AD destruction, place of the destruction? And so are they waiting for Messiah to come to finish this? What's the uh, Just a question. Is there a significance that we are praying there always? Okay, I will not finish. Right. So, until 1917, Jews were not allowed to come and pray freely, as Christians were not allowed, for example, to worship in their own churches, because Islam was sometimes so severe with the other religions. And the Ottomans, you have seen that they have turned the upper room, you will see it tomorrow, into a mosque. And, uh, you know, there has been some unjust uh, uh, treatment to other religions. When the English took control of the city of Jerusalem, they allowed the Jews to come to pray freely to this place. And they start crying and crying. So the English were the first to see this, and they said, what kind of wailing war is there? So when Israel took control of East Jerusalem in 1967, this place came under Israeli control. They rearranged the area as you see today. It was not like this. Imagine that this place was 10 feet higher than today, with lots of ground and dust around. So they arranged the sun to become a huge plaza like this, open it all the time, all the year, or during the week, and uh, with the pressure of women over the Jewish uh, authorities, they managed to have a section for them much smaller than the one of, of men, because women do not have the obligation to read the Torah and to lead the services during the prayers. So they have a small section. But at the yeah. beginning, during 15 years, they were not allowed to come. They were really uh, away from the wall, but they made the pressure and they have a section, as it is the case in any synagogue where there is a separation between women and men. So, women would come to this side, come closer, and when they return, this is the tradition, they will return backwards. They will not turn their back to the wall. Just a sign of respect. It's, trash. it's a tradition that was not written anywhere. On the other side, all men should have a kippah when coming close to the, to the wall. Because this is a holy site. And not only Jews will wear the kippah, also other than Jews, and this is the only item that everybody can wear when coming close to the to the wall. So the, the first three lines are originals from the time of Herod. Then the huge mid level is from the seventh century, the time of the construction of the mosques, and the upper section with the small stones dates back to the year 1538. So the, the first three lines are from the same period of Herod that we have seen just before. So people come and start praying like this. Or like this. It's a way to rhythm the prayer, to focus on the prayer. And some will wear what we call the tifilim, Philictor. The tifilin is a uh, leather wrap around uh, the uh, left hand side oh, yeah, yeah. with a small box fixed at the front between 
The forehead. Forehead between the two eyes. It's a way to control the action represented by your arm and the thinking represented by the brain, both focused on the prayer. And this item, the philicter or tifeline, is used only by Jews. Other than Jews cannot wear. So that's why you may see them wearing this item, this article in planes or anywhere if you want to wear. On Saturdays, if you come, you will see most of the Jews wearing the, the prayer shawl that we call talit. It's a white cloth with two black lines and with 613 fringes around. Why 613? Because this, these are the 613 commandments that every Jew should know. Commandments and advice, instruction, and steps to follow for fasting, everything. And the name Talit comes from the transformation of the Hebrew letter of Talit, of, uh, sorry, the transformation of the figure 613 into Hebrew letters. Let's give you Talit. It has to do with the 613 commandments. Every Monday and Thursdays, Jews would come and celebrate the Bar Mitzvah here in a very joyful procession. They will escort a son that will become young adult, surrounded by members of his family, carrying a tent and escorting him from the outside to the wall. And after a joyful ceremony, they will give you know, uh, things to eat, uh, gato, cakes, and for the for the for the invitees. It's the equivalent to the first communion. It's called the Bar Mitzvah, the Son of Commandments. It has also equivalent for daughters, Bat Mitzvot, the Daughter of Commandments. But since girls do not lead prayers in synagogues, there's no need to celebrate the Bat Mitzvot. And finally, this is the synagogue. We agree on that. Because what is important to have a synagogue is the presence of 10 people and not a closed building. So, on Fridays, there is an official prayer announcing the beginning of Sabbath, so it's a synagogue. They will take outside the Holy Cabinet, the Rod Kodesh that contains the Torah. And then after the prayer, they will bring it inside. On Saturdays, there's another prayer. Actually, there are three daily prayers for Jews. One in the morning, one at noon, and the afternoon. Okay. okay. What is that bridge? What is that bridge? This is the only way to get into the top of the esplanade of the mosque if you are not Muslim. This is the only way for non-Muslims to visit the Esplanade of the Mosque only from 7.30 to 10 o'clock in the mornings, from Monday to Thursday, from Sunday to Thursday. Fridays is closed because of the Muslim prayer. On Saturdays it's closed because there's no policeman walking, because the entrance is controlled by the Israeli policemen. And they check on the identities of people, especially the ultra-Orthodox Jews who wish all the time to come and visit. But they have to verify their IDs, they have to take off their shoes, and to make sure that they, they will not take troubles once they are up. But, you know, no. So the Orthodox Jews also go up there? Yes, but not no. But they will not come close to the area of the Dome of the Rock. They will walk just outside and the surrounding areas, escorted by the police. And this will not be a beautiful occasion for Muslims who are As soon as they see all the Orthodox Jews walking, they will start saying, Allah, what?
just to say that we are here, this is our place.